Let's take a moment before we begin our worship service to ask God to help us to worship Him rightly. Some of us may be distracted. There's something big happening tonight, and that may grab our attention. But here in this hour, we've set it aside to focus on the goodness, the greatness, the awesomeness, the holiness of our Creator God, and to declare publicly and privately how good He is. Let's ask Him to help us to do that. Father, you bring order to chaos. Bring order to us now. Calm our thoughts. And then hear our prayers and our praises. And help us to worship you rightly today. Amen. Let's praise God together. You are my all in all. Let's stand. scripture today from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 13 to 14 and it says no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man God is faithful he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it therefore my beloved Flee from idolatry. We bow with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this promise. We know that temptation will come because of our sinful nature. We thank you that your promise is that you will not tempt us beyond what we can stand, that you will give us an escape route for that temptation. And we just pray that we only look for that. Help us to understand that we think we're sophisticated and above idolatry, but that we still sin and we can make whatever we choose an idol. We pray that we do not do that, that we look only to your Son, Jesus Christ, as our Savior and our Lord. It's in His name we pray. Amen. I am resolved. May I stand and sing together. Amen. 
As we're gathered here today, we've come to a part in our service where we make a decision together. If you are a member here at Northeast Park, you should have received a blue ballot. Let me encourage you to pull that out. If you are a member of the church but don't have one of these, lift your hand up high so we can make sure we get that fixed right now. Okay, we look all right. After our period of nominations for the office of deacon... There was a group of men that were found to be qualified according to both scripture and our constitution. Those men were asked and out of those men, one has agreed to serve if elected. That person is before you today is Isaac Williams. So the decision is simple. If you believe that he is qualified to serve and should be serving, then you mark yes. If you believe he's not qualified to serve, you mark the box that says no. I'm going to pray, and then J.D. is going to come forward, and we're going to grab him from the choir as well, and those will be turned in, and we'll announce the results later on in the service. But let's pray before we enter into this decision together. Father, the scriptures tell us of two offices that you have set apart with qualifications given in scripture. 
the office of overseer or elder or pastor, and the office of deacon. And Lord, these two positions have very important roles in the life of the church and are not to be taken lightly. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, as we make this decision, as we speak together, that you would allow your will to be done, that you would either move our hearts to call this individual to serve over the next three years as a deacon, or you tell our hearts and trouble us in such a way that we say this would not be the right time. But ultimately, Father, in what happens, we pray that you would help us to glorify you, to lift up your name, and to follow in the path laid out for us in scriptures for acting as a church in this matter. So move in us and move through us, for we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have not already, if you would mark your ballot at this time, and I'm going to call those who are collecting them forward to start the collection process. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, today, the scripture I'll be reading is uh, from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, you, you are good. You are you're better than we deserve. Thank you for being the God that you are. Thank you that it's through our faith in your son, Jesus Christ, that we are your children, your chosen people. Help us to, to be mindful of all that you have done in our lives and how it's be only because of your grace and your mercy we can now call ourselves redeemed. Oh, Lord, help us. As we go through this world, it seems like an endless struggle for our very soul. It seems like we're always under attack. Strengthen us, Father. Guide us. And continue to teach us so that when the world looks upon us and they look on our words, and they look at our actions, they do not just see a good man or a good woman who is acting honorably, that they see a reflection of you and us. They see your love and your mercy in our lives, and that seeing that will allow us to glorify you and bring honor to your name in everything that we do and say. Father, we thank you and we love you. In your precious name we pray. Amen.
As we walk worthy with the Lord, let's also take time to be holy. Let's stand and sing. Almighty God, we thank you and praise you for the privilege to come to this part of the service and worship. We thank you that you have blessed each one of us in so, so many different ways. And we thank you that you have given us the honor of giving towards your kingdom and all of its work. And so, Father, we pray that we will have wisdom as we give and for the ways in which the, this offering is used for your glory, for your praise. Amen.
I'll start out today uh, giving you the results of the deacon election that you all just participated in about 10 minutes ago. Uh, Isaac Williams was elected uh, deacon and will start serving effective uh, immediately. Um, so we will um, uh, pray for him and the deacons this year. Our uh, church of focus that we're uh, going to be praying about today is Covert Avenue Baptist Church, which is currently uh, pastorless. They are sort of south, southeast of us a, a little bit. So uh, we'll be in prayer for them. Also, uh, remind you to pray for the crossover evangelistic effort in Indianapolis. Um, it'll actually be running this week, but the, the, the key point is on Saturday. We'll have some people from our church going to help out with that. Um, and also, uh, today is Disaster Relief Sunday throughout our uh, uh, convention. Uh, we want to um, uh, pray for that ministry. Uh, Cora uh, just had gotten involved in that. Uh, she went to training last year, went out to Oklahoma for on a chainsaw team uh, last year, and so that's a, a development over the last year. And speaking of Cora, she gave us an update that uh, they had um, some uh, storm damage at their house last Sunday. Uh, it, the, uh, it pulled their electrical box out, messed up their electric system there, but in a rejoice that, that they were able to get the electricity all resolved and uh, the tree um, from off that was on the, the roof and through the roof. Uh, we want to continue to pray for Grady as he still has fatigue and nausea and, and is still losing weight, which is all, they're all side effects of his radiation uh, that he's gone through. Um, good news from uh, Jerry Hall front uh, this last week. Uh, Jerry had received uh, uh, good news, and he is still a deemed still in remission, so we can all rejoice about that. Amen. Uh, we've had three of our uh, people in the hospital uh, this past week. Uh, Linda Strait had fallen. Uh, she has just been moved in Compass on Friday for rehab. Uh, Doug had hip surgery last Sunday. He had a stroke on Tuesday, and yesterday he was just moved to North Park Nursing uh, for rehab. And also Shannon uh, went in the hospital late uh, Wednesday night. Uh, he has staph infection. He's at Gateway, so we uh, need to pray for him. He'll be there uh, uh, probably a few more days. So, all right, well, let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Father, uh, we start out by rejoicing that uh, Jerry Hall is still, uh, still regarded and got good test results and is still in remission. We pray, Lord, you'd just continue to... Uh, bless uh, Jerry and Tammy in their health in the days to come. Father, we pray, Lord, for Grady, that you would just um, uh, help him as he regains his strength. We pray, Lord, you'd remove his nausea that he's uh, been experiencing, that he would regain his appetite and his weight. Um, we thank you that Linda Strait and Doug no longer need hospitalization. Uh, we ask that you give them strength day by day. And Father, we pray for Shannon, uh, that you would just help his body to fight this staph infection that he has so that he can get out of the hospital real soon. Uh, Father, we um, uh, pray, Lord, for uh, those involved in leadership and as volunteers with disaster relief. Father, that you would bless them as they help people uh, in disasters as they help them in your name. And Father, I pray, Lord, that with crossover this week, that much would be done as acts of service would be done in your name. And Father, with our Vacation Bible School starting today, uh, I pray, Lord, that what we do, that, that you would just bless our uh, outreach efforts, that uh, the uh, parents and kids would remember about their invitations that, they'd be, uh, uh, that they were given and they would come, and that you would be glorified through what's done this week here. Father, I pray, Lord, uh, for Isaac, that you just uh, bless him as he starts another uh, deacon uh, term, and that you just bless the deacon ministry um, this coming year. And Father, I lift up our sister church, Covert Avenue, that you would bless them while they are pastorless, bless their outreach efforts, and, and Father, that people, members wouldn't slack back just because they don't have a, um, a, a pastor, that they would continue coming. And I pray, Lord, that you would guide them as they search for a new pastor. And now, Father, I pray that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your word. Amen. You know, on Sunday morning when it's time for the sermon to come, it was really weird last week not to start. 
You know, they tell you to take a vacation and take a break, but I'm just, I can, can I just tell you that's really strange? Because while it's nice to have a break, I really like being on this side of the pulpit, all right? I'm just going to be honest with you. I like the opportunity to go through the things of Scripture and to share them with all of you. So I pray that what is said today is truly a blessing for you. If you would, open your Bibles and join me in a letter to the Galatians, the fifth chapter. Throughout this entire series, we've been looking at one fact. You cannot add works to the gospel. I've tried to put that in every sermon as clearly as I can possibly put it. That if you add works to salvation, then it's no longer the gospel message that's being proclaimed. So don't confuse what I say today with what I've been saying since February. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, decisions, Divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. There are no works in the gospel. But there should be lots of works in the believer. That's the line that we have to make sure that we never go across. As we go through this passage and we look about what actions we should not do, and then ultimately who we should be and the things that we should do, we can never move this discussion into the ground, into the territory, into the country or the kingdom of the gospel that says... Jesus Christ did all the necessary works when he lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, was buried, raised again on the third day, and then appeared to over 500 people. Jesus did it all. Period. Close parentheses. Everything we're talking about today is on the other side of believing that truth and that reality, of holding fast to the hope that we have in Christ that he in fact did it all because a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about today are things that we've done that we should not have done. They are the cause that made Jesus need to come down and die on the cross for our sins. So the most that we've contributed to our salvation is our sin that's made it necessary. I stole that line. I wish I was that clever. But that's what we contribute to our salvation. And if you're right here going, wait a minute. 
our faith, we contribute that, not according to Scripture. According to Scripture, God gave us that faith too. Every good thing that can be said about our salvation came from God. Everything bad about our salvation came from us. So as we go into this, Paul is now establish the fact that the Galatian church and us should not allow anyone to attempt to add works to our salvation. And having said that, and Paul not being a moron, then goes and talks about what you should and should not do. Because they're not separate. We want to separate them, but they're not. The one who believes in Jesus should live the way he's telling us to live in this passage. But notice, as I start out looking at all of these things, many of them which you've already heard in your life before, it's gonna be a lot of review today. But the one thing I want you to notice, so I wanna say it early is, Paul says in triplicate that pulling this off is not about you, it's about the Holy Spirit. Look what he says, verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit. Look at verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, look at verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, live by the Spirit. So don't walk around here and leave here today going, well, I got to do better. Good luck with that. It's a great aspiration, but you're going to fall on your face as soon as you go out to lunch and you have to wait longer than they told you. You've got to wait for a table. Some of us won't make it out of the parking lot. And those of us who claim to be the most holy might not make it out of the building. But the Holy Spirit can and does work in us to let us walk by him as we follow him in a life that is powered by him. So that's what we're looking at today. Verse 17. The desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You have inside of you the desire to do all kinds of things of which the scriptures have clearly said, thou shalt not. And Paul here gives us a list of 15 different items that is far from an exhaustive list 15 different things. He's like, don't do these things or anything like them. We can kind of group them because he kind of groups them. They're a little out of order because he's not trying to give an exhaustive list. But you can kind of look at groupings. The first one seems to be a sexual grouping. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Possibly later on if you jump down into 21 orgies. There's a group of these things that talk about what our bodies crave. Even people sitting in this room. Now whenever these things get brought up, we like to think about all of those people not in church this morning, not graced by a pew and not carrying their Bibles with them. Those, those evil people that are being celebrated this month, right? That's, that's who this is written to. No, it's written to us. I had the joy of listening to an INB worker this week at our association's leadership team meeting, and he gave a statistic that should break our hearts and help us to realize the problems probably sitting in this room right now. He said, of those people that the IMB works to send out into other nations, 80% of the men and 50% of the women have sexual issues, primarily pornography, that have to be worked out first before they can be sent. 
Think about that. 80% of the people that we often consider to be the most holy among us are struggling with sexual sins. So if you're in that group and in this room today, hear this. You're not alone. That's the great lie. You think it's just you and you're in a room with a whole bunch of holy people and oh my goodness, if somebody else in this room found out that you struggle in this area, that they're gonna think the worst of you. Chances are, if that statistic is anywhere close to being right, and across the board it seems to be. That when you share that sexual sin with someone else, their answer isn't going to be, oh my goodness, how awful for you. They're going to say, yeah, I have too. Or, yeah, I am too. This is not the worst of sins. But it is a prevalent sin. And as much as we would like to blame the society around us, the problem isn't out there. The problem is in here. But there's so many magazines out there and billboards and commercials and movies and it's so easy to find with our phones. Those aren't the problem because I can tell you if you cancel every subscription, if you never turn on your TV, if you get a flip phone, if you do all of those things, the problem will still be in here. Because most people who go through this don't need all those other things. All they have to do is turn on the library that's already stored between their ears. Now, while all of those things of flip phones and limiting internet access might be useful tools, they won't solve your problem. And trying to do better won't solve your problem. I've worked with too many people with these cravings. The only thing, the only way to break free from this is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Of finally acknowledging, I can't beat this. I am powerless to this. And confessing that to God and confessing that to others. Scripture's not crazy when it tells you to confess your sins to other people. Because the greatest cloak for sexual sin is pride. I don't want anybody to think less of me. So I dare not tell them my sin and my struggle. And the more you keep it hidden, the deeper into those sexual cravings you are bound to go. Now I'm not saying come up here and grab the microphone and start confessing. But I am saying if you make it through the day or this week without telling someone, then you're basically ignoring everything I'm going to tell you today. Because if you are in this, hear me, there is hope for you. I've tried. I know. It's hard. I know. But the Holy Spirit is stronger. And the promises are there. As we read earlier in this service, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability to stand. Now, you may fall on your face. You may lose battle after battle. But hear me when I say this. God's far more concerned with the ultimate war than he is a momentary battle. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't care about your instances. Don't hear me when I say that. But God uses all of the struggles of day-to-day -day life ultimately to move us towards holiness. That's what he wants from us. He wants holiness. He wants us to live not in accordance with our fleshly desires, but in accordance with the guiding power of his Holy Spirit. So we fight against sexual immorality for, from impurities. But also notice there's another 
category there, that's idolatry. Against idolatry, against sorcery. Basically, this category is the sins where we desire the creation more than we desire the creator. When I work harder for the things of this world than I work for him. That word sorcery there, the Greek word is the word from which we get the word pharmacy. Because typically what would happen is people would use drugs and certain plants and extracts and all of that to create this disorientation in the mind of people and tell them that the gods were working through them while really they were being drugged. And Paul's saying, stay away from that. But yet, yeah, isn't it powerful? This idea of going after the things that everybody here on earth are going after of devoting our lives to things that ultimately don't matter. Your pastor constantly has to guard himself against raising football to be an idol. Now I say that not as a joke, but as a reality. I constantly have to guard myself from allowing it to take that place because you're talking to a guy who has, in the middle of a Sunday evening service, checked the scores of a game. And I was the one teaching. I have to watch that area of my life to make sure that it stays in the level of recreation and not elevated to this is the most important thing to me right now. And it's liberating. Now, I can't give you all the stats. I can't even tell you all the head coaches. I used to. I could tell you every head coach, most of the offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators, all of the quarterbacks, many of the wide receivers, I could tell you what numbers they were on whatever team. My fantasy football leagues have struggled now because I just don't know them as well as I used to. I'm still planning on defeating my family this year when we make a league, but that's a story for another sermon. But do you see how easily just the small things of the, it can be music, it can be movies, it can be gardening, it can be sports, it can be your job, it can be your family. It can be church attendance. It can be all of these different things that we elevate as more important than the pure worship and adoration of all I need and desire in this life is God. He's worthy of my time. Paul says, walk away from that fleshly desire. Then there's a really big category, and I don't really know how to do it, how to word it. I tried to find a fancy word for it, but basically it's the me first category. It's the enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy. All of those things where I get mad because the world isn't saying it's Steve first. I'm fighting with you because it should be my way or no way. How dare God give you something that he hasn't given me? Well, he's not in my camp, so he must not be holy. All of these things that basically say, just show the world how awesome you are and let them worship you. And Paul says we have to walk away from those. And can I tell you, that's a really hard area to walk away from. Because all of these things can come and go in an instant. Some of these other things take other people to be involved in or hours and hours of time, but you can have a flash of rage that comes up and is gone in 30 seconds and you get all of those, you know, the serotonin hits that come from having that anger well up inside of you and it can feel good and you can feel justified. Well, I should be angry about that. 
and it's become so common, we're allowed to do these things in public. We would never think about doing the, the sexual sins in public. No, 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 that's, that's when nobody else is home. That's, that's where that one lives. In idolatry, well, that just exists here in my mind and in my heart, and I can just love and adore these things. But many of these things, well, that's just how everybody is. Everybody gets mad. And of course there's dissension amongst us. They're wrong. What, you want me to be wrong with them? I should be the best. I should be number one. Why did they get the promotion and not me? Why does mom like him best? I'm the best son. How come they got that present and I didn't get that present? I, I was the one who really wanted it. And these things are so commonplace that rarely in churches are they called out. Instead, we just say, just let them calm down. It'll be okay later. Instead of saying, what just happened was sinful. Let me warn you, if you call out anger, in the midst of anger, duck. Duck. Because I tried it once, and the guy tried to run me over in a pickup truck, literally. Like my generation's version of literally, not the new one that's, you know, metaphorical. My generation's version of literally, I called him out for anger, and he tried to run me over in his pickup truck. So be careful. These sins are things that Paul says... And it should be a terrifying word that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, Greek tense here is important. It doesn't say those who have ever or occasionally have done these things or do these things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's a tense that can be very well translated. Those who make a practice of these things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, why is that important? Because I'm telling you guys right now, you're going to do some of these things. Paul did some of these things. That's why Paul even says in here that they keep you from doing the things you want to do. We see the struggle of Paul in Romans chapter 7 where he says, the things I want to do, I'm not doing those things. The things I don't want to do, those are the things I keep on doing. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin? And praise the Lord for the answer. Jesus Christ. Notice he didn't say, I'm going to do better. He says, Jesus has already delivered me from that man. And now the power of the Spirit works in me. The last category is about giving yourself over into the things of this world, such as drunkenness, orgies, or there's, there's different... Nobody knows how to really translate that word because it's used in a lot of different things. Uh, I don't think he's specifically talking about orgies there. I think he's just talking about going along with the flow of what everyone else is doing because that's what everybody else is doing. It's the, I went to the party and I was going to be good, but everybody else was drinking, so I did mentality. I wanted to join with the group, which if we've ever been through high school, knows that's a real struggle. Verse 22, but... But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now some people group these up into groups of three. I, I don't think you have to do that. What I would have you see is there's one thing that's truly in common besides them all being a, a byproduct of the Spirit's work in your life. There's one thing they all have in common. That's the opposite of what the other 15 things had in common. The first 15 things are all about the world serving me. The fruit of the Spirit are all about me 
serving the world. I will love, which means I will care for and show grace and mercy and charity to the person that's across from me, regardless of how they've treated me. That I'm willing to forgive all for the benefit of someone else. Joy, regardless of what my circumstances are, because God is in me, because he's already saved me, I will have a joy that is inside of me that's not based on things serving me, but on the fact that God has already made me his own. It's not dependent on anyone else. But I can tell you, if you've ever been around someone with joy, you've been the one who's benefited from it. Peace. I know there's chaos out there, but I'm not going to be joined in the chaos. Because I know this for a fact that once I was at war with God, but now we are on the same side. We are at peace with one another. And if you've ever been around someone who brings peace to a situation where there's enmity and strife going on until this person comes in and then everybody seems to calm down, our peace serves other people. Patience. Come on, God, get on my time schedule. Patience says, yep, yeah, seems to be late. Don't worry, God's got this. It's going to work. Kindness. I'm going to do something nice for you, even though you just slapped me in the face. Goodness. I am going to live in accordance with the scripture and do what is right even when it's hard that the world might see that what I did was right. Faithfulness. I'm not going to turn to the things of this world. I'm not going to serve football or gardening or books or work or family, I serve Jesus Christ. Gentleness. I'm not going to bring a sledgehammer to the situation when a simple push will do. But it also means I'm not going to simply push when a sledgehammer is needed. Gentleness is not being weak. Men, you, we need to hear this because oftentimes we hear gentleness and we go, ugh. So we get the picture of somebody who's just kind of weak-spined and not doing it. That's not gentleness. Jesus was gentle and he used the whip. Gentleness is not using more force than what is needed to get the job done. That's gentleness. And who benefits from that? The other person. Because I might feel good just hauling off and knocking them out, right? That might, ah, that, make, that might make me feel better. It won't help you. Self-control. I might go, well, that's self-serving. No, it's not. It's good for us. But me staying in control is a benefit to everyone who is around me. And if you've ever been around a child who is not under control you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not going to tell you to go out and do better on these things. I am going to tell you if that first group contains something that you are sinning against a holy God in, today is the day that you need to repent of that sin. Today is the day you need to find someone you trust and tell them, I am struggling with this. This is a sin that I need to stop. I need you to talk to me about this and hold me accountable when I do this. And don't just tell me it's okay when I tell you I've done it. 
remind me that Paul says, those who continually practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God because if the Holy Spirit is in you and if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit's in you, it is incompatible with a life that's living in these sins. They cannot live in the same place. And so maybe you need to come to the point and you realize I'm not really saved. Because I really like those first 15 things and I, I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. If that's you, you're not really trusting in what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. Because those who do are new creations. And a certain type of of character comes from someone who believes in Jesus Christ. So stop doing those first things and repent immediately. And then let the Spirit live in you. Let Him lead you through the Scriptures. Let Him lead you in times of prayer. Let Him lead you when you're with other believers that are helping you walk in accordance with the Scriptures and with the Spirit. Don't forsake coming to church where you can be encouraged. And I'll make this promise to you. You keep coming. If you come week after week, I'll keep telling you what Jesus Christ did for you week after week. Because if you're anything like me, you need to be reminded at least that often. I need it more frequently. That's why I listen to sermons during the week. Because I need to be reminded. Because I get very performance-based. Well, look how God, I must be doing good spiritually. Look how good I'm doing right now. Oh, wait a minute, that's pride. Turn from your sins. Embrace Jesus Christ. And live by the Spirit. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we ask once again that you would open our eyes to see what Jesus Christ has done for us that he did the works necessary for us to be saved. But then, Father, that he calls us to walk and live in good works that are already prepared for us. And so I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that the Holy Spirit would truly fill us, work in us, guide us, and lead us, that we might turn away from the desires of our flesh, and that we might embrace these characteristics that come from following the Spirit. That those around us would benefit from what you are doing in us and through us. We want Christ to dwell in us. And we want our sins to be crucified with him. But we pray all of this in his name. Amen. This altar is going to be open. If you need to talk with me and say, I want to know more about knowing for sure that I am saved, that my salvation is held by God himself because of what Christ has done, and I, I need to talk to you about that, I invite you to come and say that. But many of you may just need to come to the altar. There's not a person in this room that hasn't struggled or is not currently struggling with at least one of those 15 things that were mentioned. And if you've not repented of those things, now's the time to do that. Not later tonight, now. And this altar is open for you to do that. Let's stand together as we sing.
I pray as you leave here today, you are led by the Spirit. That you're not pulled along this life by the fleshly desires that are in all of us. And when temptation comes, run. Don't say, I'm going to muscle through this one. Run. Call someone. Throw your phone out the car. Whatever. Run. It's that important. It's that important. But God will guide you. Trust him. Let's receive the benediction as one family. Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, thank you for your son's actions on the cross. Thank you for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit even today. And teach us to turn from our fleshly desires. Now, Father, as we leave this place today, guard our hearts and our minds by granting us your peace. Amen.